Is this the end of Intel? We are dealing with this question in today's video. So with that said, welcome, you've now made it to my quite late review of the AMD Ryzen 9 3900X 12-core CPU. Those that have followed the whole Ryzen 3000 launch know that this 12-core is much sought after and to this moment at the time of this video, availability is scarce. While I certainly did have the option to start with Ryzen 3000 testing due to the fact the remaining SKUs are widely available, I refused to do so since me being the stubborn I am I wanted to start with the 12 core model the Ryzen 9 3900X no matter how long I had to wait. Unfortunately it appeared I couldn't get my hands on any 3900X since I didn't happen to be one of those that ordered one early. But here I am now, barely alive, clinging to my keyboard, because to redeem myself for being so extremely late, I will be testing all Ryzen 3000 CPUs in the next few weeks. Every single model. Needless to say, this took really long and it was lots and lots of work, as you may imagine. Especially since on top of testing at stock settings, I overclocked every single one of those CPUs. So how did I manage to get my hands on my precious 39 x then, you ask? Well, I've made one hell of a generous offer to the guy of the German channel, GuxTV, and he kindly agreed on selling me his used CPU. He got way more than you'd have to shell out for a new CPU, so I did reward him well. But delay or not, there's also a bright side to being late. This way I in fact could test with the latest BIOS and a Giza versions. Now if you happen to be lucky to get your hands on such a 3900X at its normal pricing, you'd have to shell out about 530 US dollars. At that price we are indeed getting a real 12 core with 24 threads. Could this possibly mark the end of Intel's so-called reign? Let's find out. Included is AMD's hugely popular Wraith Prism RGB stock cooler with fancy RGB lighting. It's one cooler that in terms of aesthetics can sometimes even fascinate loyal Intel followers. But we'll see how well it does in terms of noise level and especially whether or not the Wraith Prism can take on those 12 cores and keep them cool so the CPU doesn't have to clock itself down. That we'll be taking a look at in this video too. Everything will be tested with the not so affordable but really decent and ASRock X570 Tai Chi motherboard, which obviously comes equipped with the latest X570 chipset. That one brings some nice new features to the table, the main highlight probably being PCI Express 4.0. A big disadvantage of X570 boards, however, aside from the high pricing, is the fact that the chipset now consumes quite a lot more power than predecessor chipsets did, meaning it's running hotter now, and so we are now seeing the return of something undesirable from the past, a small chipset fan. Yay! The noise level of it is greatly depending on the motherboard you use, or rather, what settings you can actually go for. The fan on this ASRock board sure whines quite a bit, even in its standard mode. But to be fair, I have to say the fan is close to inaudible once you put it into silent mode. And the chipset temperature never exceeds 65 to 68 degrees Celsius while I did all the testing, so these results are of no concern. But such X570 motherboards happen to be really pricey. Is it really Really a must going for one? No, not at all actually. In fact, behind the scenes I've done some testing on my MSI X470 board of last year and as long as you flash the latest BIOS version, such a Ryzen 3000 processor should run perfectly fine with an older board. Understandably, you will not get any PCIe 4.0 support with such a board and you should pay a little attention to your board's overall quality, especially when it comes to the VRM, the phases. So you don't want to run a 12 or even 16 core with one of the cheapest B350 or B450 boards around and have it all go up in flames. Now in order for the 12 cores not to meet such a fate, for my testing I'll be using the gorgeous and well-performing Deepcool Castle 240EX AIO liquid cooler. With that one I should be able to keep those temperatures of these new 7 nanometer processors in check. But we'll come back to the topic a bit later into the video. Just like Intel did with their 9th generation, they introduced a so-called Core i9, and AMD now has followed their steps, doing the same with Ryzen 9, therefore once more upping the mainstream high-end level. And on top of that, a 16 core is on the way too. We haven't ever seen this much performance in a mainstream CPU lineup before. This of course drives up prices to new levels for these new additional models, just like it was the case with Intel's i9-9900K. 
So I've listed three CPUs for you guys. AMD's top-of-the-line mainstream CPU of yesteryear, the Ryzen 7 2700X, and of course Intel's champion cannot be missing, this being the i9 and the 900K. The new Ryzen 9 3900X sends a clear message with its 12 cores and 24 threads. It has to be one hell of a multi-core beast, but even those clock speeds appear to be pretty damn high. Maybe even a little too high and there are indeed some issues regarding the boost clocks that don't always meet expectations. It turns out this also depends on the motherboard used. So I've done some testing for you guys, checking the clock speeds when all 12 cores are stressed and when there's only a single core in use. For the Ryzen platform we do get a feature that goes by the name of PBO for short or Precision Boost Overdrive. Basically this is an automatic overclocking feature that takes the core clocks higher if enough cooling is provided and if temperatures allow for it. On default PBO happens to be disabled on most motherboards and PBO enabled cannot be considered stock. It's comparable to multi-core enhancement or for short MCE on Intel platforms. Needless to say PBO was disabled for all my tests, since I don't want to introduce any additional variables to the mix. Now with all 12 cores at full load, cooled by an AIO liquid cooler, the chip clocks up to 4.225 GHz, at max in my case. The average however is more in the range of 4.1 GHz, sometimes even a little below that. With AMD's Wraith Prism stock cooling solution, I'm seeing about 4.025 GHz on average and 4.15 GHz at max. The max clock speed of just a single core in my case with a liquid cooler is at 4.525 GHz. With the stock cooler I'm looking at exactly 4.5 GHz. And I also wanted to check out the core clocks in-game in Shadow of the Tomb Raider for instance. Cooled by the Wraith Prism the CPU clocks at about 4.175 to 4.225 GHz. Mostly we are at the 4.2 GHz mark. With better cooling I'm achieving 4.2 and very frequently 4.225 GHz. So the differences shouldn't affect the performance too much, but you should definitely keep those clock speeds in mind. Noteworthy also is AMD's new official memory support for the Ryzen 3000 Matisse processors. 3200 MHz should be achievable natively now, even something beyond that should work fine. But due to how the Infinity Fabric works, anything over 3600 or rather 3733 MHz doesn't lead to any noteworthy performance gains. While I'd like to dive deeper into that, I fear the video is already turning out to be quite a bit longer than I initially planned. So I don't want to keep you waiting any longer let's finally take a look at those test results.
now, if I had to describe the Ryzen 9 3900X with just a single word, I'd go for beast. This no longer only applies for the multi-core aspects, but single-core workloads too. That's where Intel has been leading for many years. With their 12-core CPU, AMD finally managed to catch up, even though it clearly needs to be pointed out that the i9-9900K to be exact still for the most part remains the unbeaten gaming champion. It's just that in this performance tier, it doesn't matter as much anymore whether you have a couple FPS more or less on either side. In fact, this time around AMD does manage to come out on top over the competition in a few game titles, albeit by a very small percentage. On average, the snappy highly clocked 9900K remains the number one in games, which pretty much answers the question in the beginning of the video. No, this therefore is not the end of Intel, but let's also take a look at those 1% lows the minimums. Those of you that have paid close attention surely have noticed that the 3900X does take the lead there in more than a few titles, and we aren't necessarily talking of tiny gaps, some of it is really remarkable. But games are not, gaming is not the whole story. CPUs, especially those with a high core count, often are used for work, productivity, such as rendering and other workloads. This is where the 3900X shines big time with its 12 little babies. The Ryzen 9 is so much faster, the previous flagship, the Ryzen 72700X, and even Intel's i9-9900K can sometimes appear quite slow to be honest. Therefore, you of course have to expect a higher power draw, since 12 cores can only consume more power than 8 do, no matter if it's the 7 nanometer manufacturing process or a highly efficient design. Surprisingly though, the 3900X doesn't really draw that much more power than the 2700X does. I've been testing under AVX loads, of course, and this is where the power consumption of the i9 and the 900K goes up through the roof. To be perfectly fair, realistically speaking, there isn't that much of a difference between the 3900X and the 9900K power consumption wise, but given how much raw performance AMD's 12 core brings to the table, at that power draw is nothing short of amazing. The power efficiency simply is phenomenal, with the only exception being the power consumption at idle, but I've heard this can greatly differ from motherboard to motherboard and used chipset. What about temperatures? Well, I can definitely tell you guys, it's not the easiest task cool those new Ryzen 3000 series CPUs. They do produce quite a bit of heat, even though nothing seems to beat the 9900K when it comes to heat it appears. After all, that i9 chip was cooled by an AIO liquid cooler too, yet it still almost runs at 90 degrees Celsius. But it's clearly visible AMD's included cooling solution, the Wraith Prism, barely has a chance at cooling those 12 cores. I almost got to 90 degrees with it and that's pretty high already. On top of that, the cooler isn't exactly quite either. As good as it may look, it is very, very audible. In my opinion, for a 12-core CPU in the long run, it's more of a emergency solution than anything else by AMD. At the end of the day, the Ryzen 9 3900X deeply impressed me. The multi-core performance is brutal to put it simply. No other mainstream consumer CPU can touch the 3900X right now. And while Intel may still be on top in games most of the time with their 9900K, it can at least be said AMD caught up well with their 3900X while offering magnificent 1% lows. A huge advantage on AMD's side currently is their phenomenal power efficiency. Only at idle the results may leave a bitter aftertaste. Unfortunately, the Ryzen 9 processor is not easily cooled. I'd recommend going for a decent liquid cooler or a nice beefy air cooler. While it's nice of AMD to include their fancy Wraith Prism, at the end of the day, it's far from quiet and is barely capable of keeping the those temperatures on the 12 core CPU in check. Nonetheless, at $530, in my opinion, we are getting a overall package that's really hard to beat. It's the perfect choice for heavy intense workloads while also offering impressive gaming performance. In my opinion, for anyone that's looking to get the best possible performance in the mainstream consumer segment, you can't really look past the 3900X or even 3950X once it's out. AMD almost made this perfect, which is why the Ryzen 9 30 900X without any doubt deserves my gold award. With that being said, thanks so much for watching one of my longest videos to date. There was simply a lot that needed to be said.